Um, we are going to go ahead and begin. Um, we wanna thank you for joining us for ensuring a smooth transition of your child's IEP from one school to another. Um, it's the webinar that you have signed on for today at 12 o'clock um, and we will go ahead and continue. So my name is Jody Johnston. I'm the principal at Julie Billiard School Lindhurst. Um, I have been principal for going on 15 years and have previously been at Julie Billiard School um, for I think a total of, of 25 years. Um, and with me is Katie Bildstein who will introduce herself. Hi, I'm Katie Bildstein. I am the- oh, Katie, you're on mute, I think. No. It's not muted. Can you hear me? Oh, go ahead. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. Sorry. Uh, my name is Katie Bildstein, and I am the assistant principal and director of special education at Julie Billiard Lindhurst. This is my second year in this role, but my 13th year at Julie Billiard. All right. So in today's webinar, we are going to cover a number of topics, starting with an overview of FAPE. What does that look like in a practical setting? Uh, we're also going to talk about big transitions in life and their connection to your child's IEP. So if you are moving from your current school to a Julie Billiard school, moving to a new state, transitioning to high school or college, and then we are also going to talk about finding the right school to meet your child's needs. What are you looking for? What are some questions that you can ask another school and how can you prepare both yourself and your child? Um, if you have questions as we go along, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of the presentation, we will answer as many questions as we can. So free and appropriate public education. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is that Special education is very big on acronyms. And so a lot of times you might hear that you have given up FAPE or they may, um, you might hear people talking about FAPE. So FAPE just stands for free and appropriate public education. Um, one of the main questions that we get asked is what does it mean when you give up FAPE? So FAPE is access to the public school curriculum, public school services, um, public school programming. So when you use a scholarship like the Autism Scholarship or John Peterson Scholarship, or if you um, are choosing to enroll your child in a parochial, diocesan, or private school, you are giving up FAPE. So what you are saying is that you are no longer um, expecting and you will no longer be receiving any services um, from the public school district. Um, the public school is required by law to give each student an appropriate education. So it is supposed to meet the needs of all students and provide those services um, that students need to access the curriculum. So for example, we do not have some services that the public school district has. When you have given up FAPE, that means when you go to a private or Catholic or independent school, you cannot require them to get the services or have all of the services that your child may need. The public school district will write an IEP that is a public school document. So when you have that free and appropriate public education, it is the school's responsibility to create an individualized education plan for your child that lists all of the services, all of the accommodations that your child is going to have at that public school. If you go to the private and Catholic school, yes, you are given up the free and appropriate public education, but if you come to Julie Billiard School or another Catholic or private or diocesan or independent school, there might be services available to you that can meet the needs of your child if they are or are not on an IEP. Um, so what you get in return is a setting that you feel um, is going to support your child, that is going to meet the needs of your child, even if they don't have all of the services that are available to you. Um, so you do give up faith, but you do have control over placing your child in a setting that you feel is going to meet the needs of your child um, to the best of their ability, and you are okay with those services that are, avail are available to them. Um, with the private and Catholic schools, again, 
we are not required to follow the IEP. So when you look at our, um, when you come to an open house, we let you know, like we do not have physical therapy services. So if that's a service that's, service that's on an IEP, you have given up, if you enroll your child at our school, the expectation that we would have to have physical therapy um, services for your child. Um, so it is based on the services, the IEP or service plan, based on the services that that school has or does not have available to them. Um, when you give up FAPE, it just means that you are given up that free education that appropriately meets your child's needs. Um, but what you get in return, again, is that service and support that you feel is going to meet their needs based on the services that the school has and based on how you feel the child is going to benefit from that setting. So starting to talk about some of the big transitions, if you are looking to come to JB from your current school, there are several things to consider. Uh, the first being that Julie Billiard Schools is a scholarship provider. So we are a provider for both the John Peterson Scholarship and the Autism Scholarship. When you use the scholarship, you're using the scholarship for the services that we are able to provide. So again, you know, each of our schools is extremely transparent about what we can and cannot provide for your child, uh, but that's what the scholarship money is used for. When you come to Julie Billiard, we do not change the IEP. The local school district writes the IEP and we will honor that IEP as much as we can. Uh, we might not have the services available, like Jody mentioned, you know, physical therapy, but we try to do as many of the accommodations um, and as many of the services on that IEP as we possibly can. But when you give up FAPE, you give up your legal right to have all of those services um, you know, provided by the school. So we can give you resources uh, for areas outside of the school that can provide some of those services, but legally we don't have to follow the IEP. We try and follow it though as much as we possibly can. We also collect all of the data and submit that to the local school districts. If you are moving from one state to another, a lot of the rules depend on the school district that you move into. So the first thing you have to do is register with your school district of residence. And then they each district kind of has their own procedure as to what to do next. So they will put you in contact with the um, special education director or somebody in that office who will give you the step-by-step -step plans on how to do this. The school district of residence may adopt the current IEP. So if you're moving from you know, California to Ohio, they may take a look at the IEP and, said, and say, yes, we can provide all of these services the way that it is written. We don't need to change it until the IEP is ready to expire. However, a lot of school districts may want to rewrite the IEP, especially if you're coming from out of state, because they that school district may not have the same services or they may not um, provide the same number of minutes or whatever the case may be. So they may want to rewrite the IEP into their format and with the services that they are able to provide. If the district wants to either adopt the current IEP or rewrite it, you as a parent would absolutely be involved in that process. So it would be a full IEP meeting, everything that typically goes into it, they won't just do it without you. Um, but again, this varies between districts. So as, if you know that you are moving, um, I would encourage you to get in touch with the special ed department as soon as you can so that you can see exactly what you need to do for your child so that they're ready to go day one. Um, moving on to high school, uh, that's one of the biggest questions we get here at Julie Billiard is, you know, what, are, what do we need to consider as we start looking at high school? The first thing you need to think about is which school is going to best fit their needs. Some kids may benefit from going back to the public school uh, because simply because of the services that are able to be provided or if there's a vocational program, uh, but you really need to think about what school is going to fit their needs the best. There is little change to the IEP going from eighth to ninth grade. We will write the IEP in eighth grade as you typically would. And then, um, but there is little change depending on, again on the school you go to. They may make amendments or they may be able to provide certain services. Uh, if your child is turning 14 in the life of their IEP, then there will be a transition piece. And there are three different areas that they look at. They look at vocational skills, they look at independent living skills, and they, uh, 
the, the goals start out very, very basic, you know, so are they may be giving um, career inventories, they might look at, you know, are they able to do simple things like do their laundry or manage their money. Uh, they start out very basic, but as your child gets older and goes through high school, those transition goals are really going to be the bulk of the IEP and that's what they are going to be uh, focusing on so that your child is ready for that next step again. Uh, the IEP going from eighth to ninth grade really should try to include next steps to help the, help support the transition from elementary to high school. So you want to make sure that your child's school and their team has included all of the accommodations that they need to be successful. Uh, you want that to be very transparent as you start to write uh, the IEP and as you start to apply to the high schools. The IEP process itself will not change. Uh, for the most part, the IEPs are written by the local school districts. So you just might be working with somebody different within that district once you move into the high school, or um, you might work with a, a team of people. So that piece of it might change, but the process itself does not change. The, if you choose a private school or a Catholic school or an independent school, they will collect the data. And then again, the local school district will write the actual IEP. So when it comes to time to transition to college, one of the things to keep in mind is that your child is no longer on an IEP when it comes to college, it automatically transfers to a 504. Um, this can kind of vary or how the services come about or the services that are available may differ from college to college. So um, I know around here we have Notre Dame College that has their academic support center. Um, we also know that Mercyhurst in Pennsylvania has a strong and nationally recognized um, support program for students on the autism spectrum. Um, what'll end up happening is you will reach out to, as you're applying to colleges, I would definitely suggest looking at the colleges first to see what supports are available, how robust their programming is, how robust their services are. Um, but you would reach out to the person in charge. Um, it is usually part of the academic, um, dean of academics. Um, there might be an actual support center that you reach out to, but they'll have a process that you go through. So one of the things that happens is even though your child might have been an, on an IEP, um, if it really is some of the services needed for attention deficit or anxiety, you might need to get some additional documentation from your current doctor to say that, yes, they still have these needs and they still have these services or they still have this medical necessity. Um, and then you will go through with your child and mark down the services that are currently listed on your IEP um, or the accommodations that are currently on your IEP. Um, you can also list additional accommodations, but you will need to have a note from the doctor saying this isn't currently on the IEP, but it may benefit them to have this accommodation between um, high school and college. So for example, one of the services might necessarily, it might be a note taker. So on your child's IEP, it might say something that they have guided notes or they might have notes ahead of time. Um, so if you need to have a specific note taker or you feel your child will benefit from having a note taker, that's a service or an accommodation that you can request, but you might need to have a note from the doctor saying that it would benefit them at least for the first year during that transition to have a note taker for their classes. So the school will then go through and look um, to see what supports and accommodations your child has requested. Um, and then they will give you information based on what services they will have available. One of the things to keep in mind also, and this is why we kind of work with our students at Jubilee Billiard School to help them advocate is, as you get into high school and even more so when you get into college, the colleges do not send any of the information to you as a parent they send it directly to the student. So even if your child is on an IEP, all of the information regarding college will go directly to your child. Um, so if you have a student that has attention um, needs, you may want to make sure that they are sharing their um, email with you. You may need to go in and check um, on your own, um, but all of that information will be sent to your child. Each quarter, you will have to look and see how those accommodations and services supported your child, 
technically it's supposed to be your child that's deciding whether they supported them or not. But each quarter, you do need to fill out an additional form to say that, yes, you still need to have these services um, and all of these accommodations. So each quarter, you will be filling out information based on those accommodations, and you'll continue to do that um, uh, from quarter to quarter or semester or semester. Some colleges um, also will have additional um, supports available that are additional cost, but it will allow you to have your child meet with someone one-on-one um, -on -one weekly um, to kind of go over things that they're doing, help them with managing their time, studying, and things like that. So each college might be a little bit different. The accommodations that you have um, may be different. So you're going to want to make sure that you are looking at those colleges, um, what they have available, but when it comes to the IEP, the IEP does transition to a 504 plan at the college level. So we have um, some kind of transition questions that we get. Um, so this is gonna help you kind of plan and prepare. Um, so one of the questions is when can you get an IEP? At what age or how old do you have to be? Um, so typically when you have a child, you know, you have um, Help Me Grow or another um, kind of nurse practitioner that kind of stops in your household to see how things are going. You may notice that developmentally, um, there are things that your child is not picking up or they're not making milestones. Um, so you are able to start having an official IEP at three years of age. Um, so you can start at age three, you can reach out to the public school to say, you know, I'm noticing that they are not um, communicating as effectively um, or they're not having any communication or verbal skills. Um, you may notice some other developmental delays. And so you can reach out to the public school district. Um, they will do an evaluation to determine if your child may qualify as a preschooler with a disability or with a developmental delay. Um, if your child qualifies for special education services as a preschooler, um, many times the school districts do have an integrated preschool program where you would be able to send your child um, to get those IEP goals worked on um, with typical peers. Um, so you would need to look at your um, school district, um, but many times they will have um, uh, a placement that you can, can use for preschool. Um, you are also able at any point in time to request an IEP. So if you feel that your child is in, you know, maybe third or fourth grade and they have not been an IEP before, if you feel that they're really struggling, um, that they're not learning as well as maybe some typical peers or as well as maybe some of their siblings may have learned, you can request an IEP at any time um, and have the district do evaluations to determine if there is a special education qualification. Um, and then technically, the IEP does stop when they graduate high school, um, but there are many times where um, students will be able to have services until age 21. Um, so if your child is at a high school and they're in a vocational program, um, they're able to have those supports. They are able to do some of the work study things until I think it's 21, um, age 21, like 11 months. So by the time they turn 22, it stops, but they are able to have um, education services um, through age 21. One of the other big questions is, would my child ever stop receiving IEP services? And the answer is yes. Uh, as Jody had stated, that you know, if you graduate from high school or turn about to be 22, that would automatically stop the IEP services. But there's other reasons as well. So if a goal throughout the life of the IEP is mastered, uh, the team may decide to not continue a goal in that area. So if they master all of their reading goals, they're reading on grade level, doing what they need to do, then they may decide as a team to not continue a goal in that specific area. There would be data to back that up and it would definitely not come as a surprise um, during the meeting. The other reason that any services may stop is after an ETR. So the ETR is the evaluation team report that happens every three years. And that helps determine whether or not your child still qualifies uh, for special education services. And if the team and the testing determines that they uh, may not need certain accommodations or certain services, and because their disability is not adversely affecting their access to the curriculum, then, excuse me, some of those services may stop then as well. But regardless, it is a team decision. It's a team conversation at those IEP meetings. 
what happens if you are in a private school and you have a service plan and not an IEP? So a service plan is really the Catholic school, private school version of an IEP. So in order to have a service plan, you have to have an ETR first. And the ETR would come through the local school district. And then it can be turned into a service plan. And again, it's the, the private school version of the IEP. So it will list all of the goals, all of the accommodations, all of the things that your child would need. So if you are going from service plan to service plan, so for example, um, going from one Catholic school to another Catholic school, really there won't be many changes. Um, just again, you wanna make sure that the school you are going to can provide the same services or similar services um, or that you are okay with them not being able to provide those services. Um, so the services, service plans themselves really won't change. If you are moving from a service plan to an IEP, that's where you would contact your home school district and they will walk you through that process. Um, again, some districts will just take the service plan and convert it to an IEP. Others will ask that more testing take place. Others will ask that um, some of their interventions take place before moving it to an IEP. And they'll want all of the previous documentation from the ETR. If you are moving to a scholarship provider, you have to have an IEP. So if, again, you're going from a service plan to an IEP and you're going to a scholarship provider like Julie Billiard, in order to access the scholarship, you have to have an IEP. But again, it's written by the district of residence. And so the new school, the new district of residence uh, would help you determine exactly what the process is and what order to take those steps in. All right, so finding a school to kind of meet your child's needs. So what should you look for in a new school um, to make sure your child's needs are being met? And this varies at the elementary level versus the, the high school level. So when we're looking at an elementary school, you definitely wanna know the services that the school is going to provide. Um, Julie Billiard School has those listed on their website. You can come to an open house and hear exactly what services and programming we have available. Um, the diocesan schools also now have started their Better Together initiative, so there are some services that are available there, um, but you're going to want to make sure that what services the school has, those are the services that are going to be most beneficial for your child. Um, you need to know what they can and cannot provide, so if you're expecting um, physical therapy and you're not checking ahead of time, it may be kind of a rude awakening if you get to the school and recognize that they don't have those services available. Um, there are always questions that you can ask. I would definitely um, go to open houses. I would definitely reach out to the admissions person at any school. Um, when it comes to high school, um, you know, they have high school information nights that you can um, kind of visit or attend in order to kind of see what um, services are available. So the admissions person intervention specialist would be there that you can kind of ask them questions. Um, you want to know how, um, how likely or how well they're gonna follow the IEP. So again, when you give up the free and appropriate public education, you are giving up your right to the IEP. Um, but as providers for scholarships, we try to follow the IEP as much as possible, um, but we don't have to. So at Julie Billiard School, we are providing those services and we are able to provide many of the services that are on your child's IEP. Um, so it is pretty closely followed, um, but another school may not have those same services. So you have to figure out based on your child's needs, what are you okay with having um, at a school or what are you okay with having to maybe go outside of the school to get those services? The other thing to do is check with other families. Um, so we constantly kind of recommend our parents um, connect maybe with um, someone who has previously attended the school or is currently attending the school. Um, you may have questions that come up at the IEP meeting when you're in the public school district um, and they may have some questions, you know, um, about uh, the model of the, the program. And so we want you to be able to have those questions answered. And sometimes it's easier to get a parent perspective on that. Um, so check to see if there are other families that you might be able to talk to um, who currently attend the school to get information um, and, and ask those questions. But when you're looking for the school, you really want to be um, as closely aligned with the services that you think your child is going to need um, or have those discussions with the school to determine if those are things that you are going to be able to do outside of school.
So if you go um, to the school's website um, for understanding the special ed process, we have a bunch of different references and resources and suggested questions. Um, so these are all things that you are able to read at this time. Um, they're available on our website. There also will be a recording of this um, webinar that goes out to you so that you can kind of use those active links. Um, but at this point, um, if you have any questions, we are able to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. So one of the questions um, that came up is what high schools do Julie Blair students typically go to? Uh, and I would say that it depends every year. It, it changes every year uh, based on the kids that we have in those classes and their needs. We often have a handful of students that go back to their public school district, uh, whether it's to become part of the vocational program or simply because the services that are provided in the public school um, is exactly what they need. So we do have a handful of kids that go back to the public school quite often. We also have students that attend Villa Angela St. Joseph in Cleveland, Cleveland Central Catholic in Cleveland, um, the St. Andre Scholars Program through St. Edward High School. Uh, the, our boys have gone there. We have students that have gone to Benedictine. Um, We've had a few girls go to Beaumont. So a lot of the Catholic schools in the area, uh, but again, also the public schools. All right, so there's also a question on, um, if you're going into the early childhood field, how to support children on IEPs. And this is from um, a student who went to Elyria Catholic and is in Elyria. So um, one of the things that you wanna do is always look at the IEP. Um, look at the services that are of, that are required for that child to access the curriculum. Um, when you're sitting down at the IEP meeting, um, you really want to have an idea of what is most going to benefit your child um, or the student that you're working with. So, um, you know, if it's having an intervention specialist, you want to be able to have someone there who's um, has the background and professional um, background in order to kind of work with a student, um, kind of keep things very multi-sensory. Um, if it comes to reading, you know, Wilson and some of the specific programs that are available. Um, but I would think that the best thing to do is just to kind of honor the student and recognize that each student is a child with needs and different needs. Um, and so the IEP is just a way for them to kind of level that playing field um, to be able to access the curriculum in a way that's going to be helpful to them. Uh, the next question is, do you have to get another IEP if you are transitioning from one district, district to another before coming to JB? No. So the, what you'll need to do is register with your new school district. So if you are moving from, say, South Euclid to Cleveland Heights, you would have to register in Cleveland Heights first, um, have them, and then we would help you with the process if you're coming to JB from there, but you have to uh, register in the new school district before you can really do anything else. And a lot of times, if you're going from school district to school district in this area, they'll just adopt the previous IEP. Any other questions? Um, so someone had mentioned that they are still attending college, um, and if they're 20, do they still have their IEP? So when you attend college, it does switch to a 504 plan, so you're still able to get the services that you need at the college level, um, which could be like uh, notes or a note taker for you. You can still have tests that are um, extended time on test, or you can have tests in a separate setting with small groups. Um, you can be able or have like where you can record the lessons or the, the classes. Um, so there's a lot of different services that are available, but it technically isn't an IEP. It's going to be considered a 504 plan, um, but the services and accommodations that you have that you previously received on your IEP, you would still be able to receive at the college as long as that college can provide those services. So just like each high school is different with the services that are available, 
Um, each college is going to be different. So you're gonna to wanna to look at the colleges that are available and the support that they have um, at each of the colleges that you're looking at. Um, what was the name of the college in Pennsylvania? So we've had a number of our students, it's called Mercyhurst College. Um, we've had a number of our students that have graduated from high school. Um, and when they come back and talk, they have visited, they have attended Mercyhurst. Um, they have, I believe it's called in the Ames program, um, but it is specifically for students on the autism spectrum. They do a, I think it's like a two week immersion class prior to the fall um, so that the students, I think one of our students had mentioned that they went and they learned how to ride the public transportation um, in the area and they learned how to do their laundry. Um, they learned um, kind of like where all the buildings were in the school. And so it's a pretty good program for students kind of transitioning to that high school. So Mercyhurst is in Erie, Pennsylvania, um, but Notre Dame College, which is right around the corner from Julie Billiard School has a really strong academic support center um, I know they have a lot of the services and supports for the students, whether it's um, uh, reading or learning A to Z, it's um, the Kurzweil programs so that they have speech to text or text to speech. They have support and tutoring that's available. Um, so you can look at each college and kind of see what supports are available um, at each of their academic support centers. All right, so we want to, I'm trying to get back to the other screen that has. Um, so our next webinar um, series that we have is a day in the life of JB, of a JB student honoring and managing your child's IEP. Um, so it'll be another virtual, that one will be next Thursday, March 10th um, at 12 p.m. So if you haven't registered, please make sure that you go ahead and register now. Um, and we'll continue with our uh, webinar series. Um, we'd love to be able to hear kind of your story and explore how you can use Julie Billiard School as a resource. Um, so you have information on the screen right now in regards to emailing for admissions, um, our school website that you can look at for a number of different resources that are available um, or a phone number that you can call um, to speak to someone directly. Um, if you don't have any other questions, we'll go ahead and end um, the webinar um, in a few seconds, but we thank you for attending um, and we appreciate um, you taking the time to spend a little bit of time with us.